Sacraments by our dear friend, Professor Nelson Rivera, who did such a fabulous job last week. I hope you uh, visit our website. We are attempting to get to working with correctly <laughs> so that you can listen to last week's. It was fabulous. Yeah, so, I tried to find it. It wasn't up. Like, it, it, it is up. It's just very roundabout. I'll let you I'll thank you for it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. It's very circuitous. Which was <laughs> <stop. laughs> okay, my friend. Thank you for the you're on. I'm looking at the room. Elizabeth. So far we don't have anybody. No, no, no. So it's not just my computer that is deceiving me. Okay. No, because I, I like when some people sometimes have a question or a comment online, but I know you can also monitor those. But right now is it's us. Oh, okay. But they will be able to see. Oh, I need to of course share the screen to do that. Okay. We'll be ready. Well, they are now. All right, so last week, if you recall, and I hope those of you who were not here that they can watch the recording. So maybe uh, uh, sharing with them the link. <laughs> you know, things are so hard to find in a web page or a website of any organization about the church or this church. Uh, but last week, what we were trying to do was to speak about the meaning. Of the sacrament, uh, especially not just as we Lutherans understand this. And as we know, we Lutherans are together uh, with many of Protestant churches in emphasizing the, the two sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. However, in the book of the Lutheran Confession of Writings, the book of Comfort, especially in the Formula of Comfort, it does say that confession and absolution, because of the absolution part, meaning the forgiveness part, declared forgiveness, it may be conceived a sacrament. And it actually uh, has the test, so to say, because if we say, of something that Jesus engaged or was involved or asked us to do. Well, he asked the disciples to think and he himself during his lifetime, earthly ministry, and then the recent one for gay thing. So there's plenty to go by Jesus himself in the practice of forgiving thing, or as we would say, giving absolution. So again, it's, it has always been open for conversation and debate among Lutheran or between Lutheran and other Christians. Uh, of course, as you know, in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, absolution, a convention of absolution is already considered a sacrament. Uh, so, so we we uh, laid the foundation for what we're going to say today. Today will be more specific about the meaning of baptism, but also the meaning of uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, are there any questions? Because I think that most of you were here or online last week. Are there any questions from last week when you thought more about it or anything that we said? It may come to you as we anyway uh, proceed today. I have a question for this week. Oh, well, okay. uh, it may be the answer may already be there. 
episode. All right, I'll wait. Write it down. I am writing it down. I started to write it down, but I don't want to forget. Okay, I'm with you. Well, let's start by saying, oops, yeah, the sacraments, whether baptism or the Lord's Supper, or whether we want to consider absolution of the sacrament, the key here here they convey, they declare, pronounce, proclaim by whatever word you want to use. The gospel, the essence of the gospel of Christ. So now the sacraments are actions or events, right? I when we pour water, say the words about baptism, we baptize in the name of God, and you know what happens at communion, the gestures, and the element of the hands of the elements, and when we eat and we the elements. So those are actions. They are called also events, because, for example, in the case of communion, we do it again and again. The church, of course, many Lutheran churches face it. Uh, so an event is something that is performed at the time, right, on real time, so to say. And they were instituted, commanded by Jesus. So that much is clear, right? We said that last week. Already. So the gospel, meaning the gospel of forgiveness, <coughs> is communicated through the sacraments in different ways because there are different actions. There are different elements involved. There's something that is unique to each sacrament. And there are many things that they share in common. So the gospel is communicated in different ways through the sacraments, not only through text. See, in the case of the Lord's Supper, we use the words of institution, like in the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he said, you know, take it or bring it. But again, those are the texts that we have from the tradition. And we have also the baptismal formula in the name of the triune God, as the recent Jesus himself commanded us, go baptize in the name of the Father and teach them all uh, So, but not only through text or through the spoken word, of course, we do a lot of text and uh, reading, but also through the images, right? And I was looking at the at windows, and glass windows to the door. Holy Spirit, challenge, etc. So there are the symbols, the images, or the colors are used in the queen of the paramount, the pastor soul. So the color, the community, something, an emphasis, a mood, uh, some meaning, the gesture, right? Or pray, or do like this, or open wide or arms, objects, you know, like chalice or the plate or now the little cup that we do. <laughs> and the sound, and the sound, etc. <laughs> you know, last week I took it home to show it to my wife. <laughs> and then she took it and put it up aside. She doesn't yes. want me to yes. recycle it yet. <laughs> Yeah, but there you go. Objects and the fact that someone thought about, oh, let's give it the shape of a little cup or chalice. That's genius, right? Again, it appeals to the senses. Last week, we said a lot about uh, the worship itself appeals to the senses. That if we get all our senses involved, then the worship is richer, right? Uh, the, eyesight and, and hearing, taste and see that the Lord is good. So taste, eat the bread. You know, in the churches that use incense, or in many churches they give the flowers with beautiful bells. Or, so again, involving all the senses. So the gospel does not merely convey information. It's a lot about the story of Jesus, etc. and the 
the teachings of the church, but it also communicates, as we have been saying, action. Also, trust. After all, Jesus is the one always guiding, guiding us. Home, gather, pray, uh, serve one another. Again, it's always that inviting of building this trust. Trust to engage these actions. Trust me, it's for you good and everybody good. The building of community. Are there any questions about that? Um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Please. I'm sorry, I wasn't here last week, but did you discuss the question uh, who is permitted to administer the study? Hmm. We mentioned passing, not didn't quite answer that question. Of course, we mentioned that we uh, ordain people, men and women, for the public ministry of the church and that public ministry in good of course represent the church in the world preaching to a congregation inside the church or outside the church the administration of the sacrament uh so we did we just speak so a little bit about that um but do, do you have one specific uh, concern in mind on that regard. I was wondering where the burden is with the average to give the sacrament. Good question. And we mentioned last week that, especially concerning baptism, uh, the church has always accepted as valid, the church of course, centered as valid. The baptism uh, administered by a lay person. And of course, there have been a lot through the centuries, a lot of conversations, a writing, an argument about what are the criteria, you know, what are the circumstances. Like, like even today, in which circumstances a lay, a lay person would just go ahead and baptize someone? Like, for example, in the case of what we call an emergency baptism of uh, a uh, of a newborn child who is going to die, and uh, the parent wants to baptize the child, and there is no pastor available. Uh, the Lutheran Church actually says, you know, if there is, say, if you're in the hospital, if there's a chaplain, and the chaplain is Catholic, hey, go ahead. If that is a, a, a valid baptism or a Methodist chaplain, if there is no Lutheran pastor available. But if there is no Say for the sake of the argument, a pastor, a lay person, and a minister, the bad. Uh, and so, what I'm trying to say is that there has been a lot of conversation that each church, including the OTA, has something to say or has already said a few things about in which circumstance we should be open. Now, there have been also conversation about the which kind of circumstances, what kind of context of emergency, a lay person. Actually, the, uh, we were commissioned, authorized uh, lay people to become uh, communion of disciples. I mean, I have known quite a few of those in the past. Again, oh, this criteria. Some of the studies there have done just that. So there are there's criteria. Yeah. There are yeah. definitions. Yes. Yeah. And the elements have been consecrated mm -hmm. that we would take out. Oh, there are also, in, in some contexts, they call it extraordinary means. I mean, those who, the, the label is really to take to others what have already been saved. Concentrating uh, or extending the table mm -hmm. outside of the church. There are a number of phrases, language that I use to convey that meaning. But I'm talking now, uh, and I thought it was 
to her question about the possibility of a late person actually presiding at the oh. table. And I said, when a bishop authorizes <clears throat> a late person to go, say, X, Y congregation that, haven't, that doesn't have a pastor, and it's so hard to find uh, interim pastor or retired pastor to go there, that bishop authorizes many times it's a member of the congregation I never knew to that. preside at the table. And they put it in writing. You know, that person is even a letter uh, that authorizes, it's like a license uh, to perform for the next, say, six months or three months or one year. So it's, it's rather more common than we might hmm. think. Uh, oh. Uh, in, in many, if there is someone already available, for example, uh, deacon, deaconess, associate ministry, etc. Uh, now the EOCA has uh, created just an umbrella term. Now they're all. And they can, and they are uh, commissioned. Though the work may be obtained pretty soon, to work and serve instead of work and sacrament. So, if they are looking for someone older than a minister of work and sacrament to preside, well, logically, oh, is there one who has already been separated for work and serving? Is there already a deacon available? Then. Uh, you know, logically, that would be the first person to go, but it doesn't have to be. But it's kind of neat. Yes. Uh, now, uh, again, is there are specific criteria and circumstances that to be met, and you need the authorization of the bishop of that seat. Uh, she or he is the one to take that call and write that letter. Does that make sense? Again, those are existing practices and rules. Now, that doesn't take away, of course, this freedom of tradition that we put on the grade of preparing people, specific people. We know nowadays we learn them, uh, train them, uh, prepare them for the public. Of work and sacrifice. That includes a board presiding at the table, but it's not one that goes beside the table. It is about marriage, married people. It's about, again, the public things of the church out there uh, in society. The visibility that uh, uh, partially has, you know, that visibility, etc. Yeah, I hope I I, I, want, I did some justice to your question and concern. It's a long topic, no doubt about it. Yeah, the same, uh, that it, within certain circumstances and meeting some criteria in, in so-called emergency circumstances or situations, a lay person is able to can baptize and is a valid baptism. Not because those that are <coughs> actually the Christian church for centuries has said that. So this is not new, this is the job oh, created this in the last 10 years or so. No, it's been part of the tradition. Uh, I, was, I was reminded recently that even Jesus did not baptize. That being uh, because the baptism <coughs> that we uh, do is the baptism in the name of Jesus, okay. in the name of the final God. Uh, it is, this is the, the baptism that provided and now practiced as a command given by the uh, baptized. Uh, so there has been a it's, a, it's a question of New Testament interpretation, uh, whether John's baptism, you know, the baptism practice, uh, baptism practice in the name of Jesus the first the same, similar, overlapping, 
baptism of repentance. But there is a story in Acts of the Apostles where a group of people are asked, have you, have you heard about the Holy Spirit? You know? Uh, what kind of baptism do you have? Uh, John's baptism. Oh, come on. We're going to baptize, baptize you in the name of Jesus. Then he holds hands so that you receive the Holy Spirit. So there's a very interesting story where even in the book of Acts, they're saying, wait, there is a, a new baptism now in the name of Jesus, all the baptism, which is what the church practices. Again, it's, but it's a a matter of interpretation, stories and texts. Well, actually, if, if one is baptized in the word, Jesus is there. Jesus is doing the baptizing. Yeah. yeah. The living uh, Saint Paul is the one who calls Jesus. So Jesus. His presence is yeah. like his presence yeah. says, the he's Eucharist. present in the word, he's present the actual event. Uh, Aveda. Aveda. Yeah. Uh, I have today is only a few slides and, and then we'll continue with a with a question, but again I can repeat or clarify at this point. Paul, if you have something for us, sure. you go ahead. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Baptism and affirmation of baptism. So, as you know, baptism is, is has been called the rite of initiation into the life of the church. But what exactly really is into the life of the church? But we just said baptism to receive the Spirit, right? Uh, is communion with God in Christ. We come to the Lord's table. So it's the Different aspects of the life of the triune God. We are made participants of the life of God in many ways. Baptism justifies and saves. That's the language that is used, for example, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. Uh, write that down so that you can check it out on your own, so that you can continue thinking, reflecting on this topic. Uh, baptism, as we were saying, grants the Holy Spirit. And here is the passage. I'll write it down. Check it out. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. Also, you can check Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. When this is recorded, does it record the slides as well? Yes. Oh, okay. Good. Good it's to video, know, right? It's yes. video as well as audio. But it's more than the audio. You also, you'll you also see the slides. Yeah. Okay. You have the full yes. yeah. screen picture. Yeah. Baptism, as you have heard many times, is washes. That is a bath. Washes us. Granting for All the things that these events um, accomplish. We believe, and the, we, we had a conversation about this last week, uh, following some of the questions. Uh, we believe in one baptism. I, I like to emphasize that uh, because there is this idea that, say, oh, Luther has believed in infant baptism, meaning like if that, that was the only thing we did. It's really, infant baptism is a consequence of the gospel. But we, what we practice is one baptism. So to the question, uh, do we, Lutheran, can we baptize adults? Of course, if they don't have any baptism yet, of course we can. Can we baptize teenagers? If they haven't been baptized, of course. So again, that's why I like to emphasize that what we believe is in one baptism, meaning we are not rebaptizing 
And that was, as you know, a conflict from the Reformation that the people who were called Anabaptist, it means rebaptizing, and there was a lot of conflict and critique against the group of rebaptizing. So we Lutheran I stood on the side of this one because if you rebaptize someone who has been already baptized before, uh, it's like saying that it's not valid, that church is no good whatsoever, there was the Holy Spirit, and we're not in a position speaking about say with this Roman Catholic or Methodist Presbyterian or whatever is that. to argue, I, I don't want to say right now anything away from, they have their own arguments, theological arguments. Uh, sometimes they call it believers mm -hmm. of baptism, meaning that when someone is in the position to actually by herself or himself publicly love, declare her or his faith in Christ or conversion to Christ, you have a confirmation about? Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, affirmation of we we do practice affirmation of baptism through processes like uh, confirmation, etc. So because we do believe that baptism or baptism ought to be brought to memory. Yeah, if you were an infant, of course, what well, memory do you have? Well, you have the witness, parents, God parents. Uh, and you are growing in a church community, you have received instruction. At some point, you will be called to make a reaffirmation, right, of your baptism. Actually, it, there's a sense in which one of the conf uh, confession uh, rituals that we use to start with a reaffirmation of baptism by pouring water and speaking about the moment of baptism and the meaning of baptism. So uh, there, there are ways in, to do this reaffirmation on in a given Sunday of service. And I have seen it happening in many places. Uh, 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 I, and then, I was thinking one of the differences, um, so we do not consider affirmation of baptism practical because we consider, I mean, this is what we're teaching the kids, so tell yeah. me if I'm wrong. No, no, no. So we, you refer uh, the baptism. The baptism exactly. is the sacrament. We're, we're making a promise ourselves yeah. as for adults, you know. But I think what I've noticed is the difference between our tradition and some of um, uh, churches that require baptism is we understand baptism as like three gifts of God's grace. We don't do anything from them. Babies can't, babies can't recite anything. They can be baptized. And I think in those particular churches, they don't look at them as free gifts. They it's more of a work relationship kind of thing where you have to do something in order to get that sacrament. Is that is that how you understand it? Yeah, well, that's the, the difference traditional critique that mm -hmm. we look at as I'm not just yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that should have been of baptism or even access to a of question of good works of works of righteousness. That is all what is effective, that would be effective, good, effective, yeah. that it would rely on our own. It doesn't mean that we don't think that good works are good. Yeah, yeah, they're good. That's why they're called good works. And all that piety doesn't have a place in the Christian life. Of course, of course it does. What we're saying is that the effectiveness of the validity of those sacraments is not dependent on my piety. So, now, we do require baptism. 
uh, is just <laughs> we baptize for salvation or justification. Oh, well, we don't have but, to do anything. We but don't have to do anything we, we don't rebaptize. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, why do we baptize? Remember, in, in principle, there are infants that are born into the Christian community. In, not just into the congregation, of course, it's, it's self understood, it, but into the Christian community. Could be another congregation, Lutheran or some other, but again, into the Christian community. Christian parents bring their own faith to the So, why? Why do you think? Uh, it's a gift. It's a gift to my child. It's a gift. Yes, yes. It's a, it's a question of faith. Well said. What else? What else can we say? It's a promise of salvation that you want to have from Okay, if a child is not baptized, I don't believe that that means that they're not going to be with God. But I think it's as much for the adult as it is the baby. That the adult is saying, I stand for promising that I will do all that I able to keep this child aware of God, that I will help educate them, I will give them the gift of knowledge of the time. So I think it's the earlier that you can inculcate that the parent is good. But I don't think if the baby is not baptized, Sorry, as usual, you use really like four different arguments. <laughs> <laughs> They're all good. Uh, <laughs> one of the arguments, the first one was, uh, well, I don't believe they haven't even been baptized that God would just throw them into the fires of hell or something. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, the argument there is the mercy of God. That ultimately, the mercy of God yeah. trumps over any question Everything of justice yes. or whatever. It's, it's up to the mercy of God ultimately. Uh, the other of the three of the other three arguments were about okay, the, the baptism. Is a, yes, it is a witness. It's a we baptize everybody, not just the uh, the infant, but let's say the infant as a public witness that we follow the Jesus's command of go and baptize, right? And so it's a public witness of our trust in what Jesus said and commanded. But it's also a, a commitment and intention also that parents, the parents, the congregation at large commits itself, everybody commits themselves to raise this child to be saved. Fear of God, but as also Jesus said, baptize and then do what? Teach then all the things that I taught you. So we made that commitment very early because we start very early to teach to teach the Christian faith. And of course, the Christian faith is more than just the way of Christian uh, We also declare that the Christian of God. Adults or children, there is no crime, right? Uh, God already came. So, we baptize infants because we believe probably the best example of someone, the infant, who hasn't done anything yet to gain. Any grace or any faith, either. So, if there is someone who cannot claim to have paid for that baptism, so, uh, yeah, I, the problem, one of the problems I have with the, the second baptism that some of the churches uh, is that that person testified. But God already has sent us a, a, a stream of love and, and salvation from God as the child. So the whole 
thing about Jesus. I think that's a critical point because in baptism, the baptized, the infant, is not the actor. Mm -hmm. God yeah. is the actor. Yeah. God, God is accepting the infant. The infant is not accepting God. Or the adult is not accepting God. God is accepting the person. That's part of the way that I'm being accepted by God. Oh, don't forget Lydia. Huh? Don't forget Lydia. Lydia, yeah, that means she was she was a wealthy woman and she was baptized and all of her household. Yeah, and we know that from very early, that's what Christians become to to baptize her family and also her husband. Let's be yeah. talking about that. Okay. Uh -huh. Some churches uh, have a close communion. Including some Luther. So we know who we're talking yeah, about. Yeah. I was there. Upper Dublin has an open table for this. Uh, is that receiving communion an open table without having been baptized? In the balance of the feet of the body. Uh, that's a very controversial uh, issue. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, You're on the spot now, Nelson. Oh, but maybe I should just move. But I start the next slide <laughs> and then go back to that. That might be some a bit of an answer there. Uh, it's this con is controversial. Uh, there are churches with whom we have ecumenical relation, other Christian churches. We have in some cases a full communion agreement who little by little, at least some sectors within those churches, they have been embracing the concept of the table as a evangelistic medium or tool, meaning bringing the table, the Lord's table, the communion to many places, say a parking space, and invite passerby to participate Well, conversation, of course, and prayer and a blessing to participate. So uh, in some cases they do it and they say, are you a Christian, are you a community? But in other cases, I know I have read some of the writings uh, arguing for making of the table actually our main outreach. The table itself becoming the, the outreach tool by itself. Mm -hmm. And in that case, uh, there's no guarantee that those who participate of that activity or come to that table in the parking lot or in the woods, wherever, or on the street, that they have to I know cases where the question is asked and cases where the question ah. So, but again, this, there's still a lot of conversation going on official, okay, official saying uh, that means that it is for bad times. Or not like this, and the tape, I'm talking. Yeah, so again, but there is a, an ongoing conversation, discussion on that regard. I, I could say more later, but uh -huh. I, I just can say so the disciples probably weren't baptized, and Jesus, they were the first ones to, you know, he just said, Take and eat, take a drink. <laughs> so I feel like when it's God's gift to give, mm -hmm. it's sometimes we get in the way. Of God's gift and His mercy yeah. by yeah. trying to make all these requirements, we yeah. could just take it the way Jesus did it, and uh, He gave it. You know, He didn't say baptize with these requirements. requirements. He didn't say yeah. take it, eat, you know, do this in remembrance of me. It was requirements, and so I think sometimes we get the little God's grace. <laughs> but that's I understand that's what I know. I understand we need good order. I, I understand. 
understand that. But, but that's what an open yeah. table. Yeah. An open table uh, has a yeah. pet yeah. meaning. Exactly. If, yeah. I mean, I understand it. If a church, a congregation says, we practice that and what? Everybody's invited. Traditionally speaking, and you may recall this in the Buddha, yeah, it, it said, uh, if you are a baptized Christian, da, 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 come yeah, to the table. so I have seen, of course, and you have seen. And that's you know, I and more and more congregations and speak of have been not including that uh, warning any longer or, well, that, that, or that instruction. But there are still congregations who have it. So mm -hmm. like you know, like in the bullet, oh there's a in italic come to the table you are a child of this or this or five six. So in other churches, it could be even more strict. So again, and might be different interpretations of what it is, but in my understanding, everybody's invited, it's there, and I'm not going to ask which. So, so chances are that because we're not asking the question, and of course, there are pastors and bishops that should ask. We should add in advance for the service. We should instruct ushers, deacons to make sure, you know, that, again, uh, that's a, a topic for conversation. Any uh, congregation that comes, for uh, uh, what I have seen again, Luther, an increasing, increasingly an open state, which again, we operation. Again, you know, we we get so much. Uh, uh, and yeah, have you been praised? We have baptized in Luther, mm -hmm. and they've been put in Luther Church. I was not allowed to pick you know, but I was mm -hmm. and but eventually, and this has happened 40 years ago. Uh, at least <laughs> that we separated the, the, the confirmation process uh, from the first communion. So uh, many years ago, I don't know if oh, I'm yeah, to man, say it, that it shows, no, I don't try to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but already when I was a, I was a seminarian in the mid eight. And uh, already the church at that time, the Lutheran Church in America, had produced resources strictly for First Communion, meaning the process of First Communion had already been separated. Yes, that came later. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the next thing was okay, but how early the process for First Communion? I had a teacher, we have been working. <laughs> who insisted, oh, at least nine or ten years old, other congregations started, no, oh, eight years eight years old is good. By the time I graduated, it was being done with six years and seven years old. Or, you know, uh, now I haven't checked again <laughs> lately uh, how they do in first communion, for example, here, at what or grade, you know, like, oh, when they're in first grade. It's not uh, an age here. It's not an it's not an age of grace. It's um it's all open to it. and, and actually what, what what opened it for us is we had some members who joined whose parents were pastors. And those kids when they you know they when they got up and they want they wanted to have what the other people had, their their thought was if they are reaching for this, we should give it to them. But we do celebrate first but we have kids who celebrate first communion. No, they're taking communion since they were children. It gets and, more, yeah. it gets <laughs> more just, complicated than that. Yeah. Because I have presided in many congregations. Why is it? Uh, 
there are people coming to from for communion and there's the two-year-old, three-year-old, the mother, um, and, and I look at the body. Huh? Did you give your child a stone if they ask for bread? <laughs> <laughs> My practice is look at the, at the not because I want to try it, but because there are parents who would say, you know, yeah. so I'm not gonna, uh, I mean, I'm not, we're not gonna start an argument right there, right? <laughs> and there are parents who are like, yeah. and I trust, yeah. have to trust the parent in the yeah. sense that in that congregation, it may be the case that they are already practicing that or not. I don't know. I should ask in advance, but it, again, you forget because you get to a congregation and it's that you want something there, you're trying to review so many things. <laughs> the last question in my mind was to say, what if a two-year-old comes to the forward? But again, that's happening, that there are parents and congregations who are actually uh, communing the two, three, four-year-old without the instructions on first of union or mm -hmm. though sometimes actually I shouldn't say that sometimes there are resources for the first communion that are strictly directed at time. Meaning that is preparing the body to bring a very low time to first communion. See the evolution, you know how yeah, where, where we are now, where we were before. Isn't that something we hope? In the, in the baptism service, we're asking the parents to bring the child to church on a perennial basis. Mm -hmm. Prepare them for communion, the sacrament, and so on. So when they do that, I always, when I had first communion class, I would say any parents who are willing or the parent work with their children, they should come to class. Boy, all the barriers. If it was important to them and they came, then they should always the first communion that was the baptism. When I was a, a working pastor, I mean a congregational pastor, there was a resource for First Communion that was four weeks. Three first weeks, and we're talking about first second. Uh, the first three weeks was with children, and the last lesson fourth week was with the parent. Uh, so, and I found it very, very helpful. Uh, again, I'm talking about the late 80s. And they are early nice, <laughs> but there have been more resources ever since. Uh, ours is children at hand. Oh, cool. Parents are a part. Parents are a part of it. But but we, when my children received first, they were in fifth grade. That was kind of the rule. But then, as I said, times changed, and people just came. So we 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 want to help children understand the skills that they're. But it's not a requirement uh, in this particular congregation. I mean, that's not my position. But it's important that congregations pick up on that in yeah. the council as yeah. leaders, Christian education leaders, those who teach Sunday school children. This is an important conversation. If we hadn't had any conversation, we wouldn't be working. I mean, a better place. Mm -hmm. It happened because there were conversations and questions being asked. And sometimes we choose the boundaries of the right? uh, We're losing us at the Wow, what time is it? I, I, I lost sight at 12. Oh my God. So uh, I can do this very quickly, but in mean, five minutes. Uh, wow. I may have to come back. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm saying this to so all can hear. He promised me sitting in church. Oh, in church. <laughs> that he would come back in the spring. Okay. So that's a, I mean, like a sacred oath. <laughs> because it was in church. In church. That's, that's right. right. I'm holding it to you, friend. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll show you this. And again, is because it's been recorded. You can go back or take a picture. Uh, the Lord's Supper is a fan. Festive meal, dinner in the Jewish manner, where we offer Thanksgiving. You know, Eucharistic, it comes from the Greek Eucharisteo, I give thanks. That's what it means. So, and it's a blessing, a 
for the goodness of God, for the being that we're receiving from God. Uh, but it's also in uh, Jesus himself, I'm sorry, in his farewell meal, right, last meal, gave thanks, blessed, and said, to like that. So that's what we follow, right? And in our thanksgiving, now we include Jesus. And for his life, for his passion, and Jesus, I, I always like to add, I love it, and also because I think it conveys a good sense of the relation to Jesus and the way we practice the faith. Jesus is the host. Why do you think you still call the Lord's suffering? We are there because of him. So uh, we say that the the presider actually is the symbol in the flesh of Christ at that point. We say all of that. But Jesus is also a guest at the a guest for it emphasizes the humanity. Human with us and for us there. But Jesus is also many times but the one that was left outside or behind, the one we forgot to invite. Jesus explained to, uh, or as some people use this uh, phrase, uh, Christ outside. But many times, or the same as the church door, that we go the door and we left on the outside. Well, we left Jesus outside. So Jesus is all for all. The meal, the Lord's table, is a, is a meal sign of the main sign in communion. And this is a very Luther thing. Luther was the one who said, the main side is not so much the bread or the wine. Take and eat, take and clean. But it's also a fellowship, a donia. After all, uh, oh yeah, there's mystery, but not one to be analyzed, but to be participated on. How come God will invite us in it? In it. A meal or sin. I want to eat. Every such meal points to the future. For his death, to the great communion in the time of the great God. You can check that on Luke chapter 24. Uh, 15 to 18, verses 18 to 18. This is actually every time that we come back to the table. What we are doing is anticipating, looking forward to this catastrophic time when Jesus fell drinking again with us. And he would do it again. Uh, so. Just sitting here, I'm recalling how I was taught in my family about this and so I asked a lot of questions so I was finally told by my mother accept do not dissect mm -hmm. and when she said that to me it made all the sense of the world and from that moment I have accepted take receive eat drink uh, the participation of Jesus. At Luther, we emphasize that the real Jesus, we are present there in, uh, with the people, in the elements, in the eating and the drinking of Luther. Uh, so that's why Luther insisted that the two elements, bread and wine, be given to everybody. Uh, it wasn't really about the bread and wine. So that everybody participate of the eating of the bread from the cup. Okay, I think I'm the wow.
Wow, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.